In war, there are always casualties, but it doesn't mean you give up the fight. How? How can you go out there again? After what just happened? I don't know how you do it. You saw those people get massacred, and that's just the start. I'm doing this for the good of Gotham. To stop things like this from happening again. But they don't stop. They never do. That doesn't mean we quit. It's really about not pulling from and paying homage and tipping the hat to previous versions of this, but really trying to come up with your own version. I feel like Batman really does an amazing job of walking that gray line. You don't know if somebody is a villain or a good guy. I'm not blind to the damage I cause, nor am I to the chaos that swirls in Gotham. But I have to believe the good outweighs the bad. In other games, you never get to see that aspect. You're wearing the cowl, you're driving the car, you're beating up bad guys. You still get to do that in this game, but it's about who Bruce Wayne is after he's decided to become Batman. How do you want to play this? I'm having a bit of an identity crisis for this video right now. I can't decide whether to call this a critique or a love letter because I have nothing but genuine heartfelt compliments for this game. I honestly can't find many reasons to not love it. So what can I say about this game that hasn't already been said? Quite a lot, actually. I'm kind of shell-shocked by how far this story flew under people's radars. I barely see anyone talking about it, but if their experience was anything like how I initially perceived it, then I understand. This game was one of those games that I would occasionally watch clips out of context on YouTube with mild disinterest. I could never quite take the art style or play format seriously, especially not after being exposed to the Arkham series. However, on one fateful day during the December 2019 Steam Christmas sales, I gave into my destructive impulse buying tendencies and decided to give this game a go. And my god, I could not have made a better decision. I think Telltale has crafted the absolute perfect depiction of Batman. The Telltale Batman is kind of the perfect love letter or homage to the character of Batman, while still distinctly creating something entirely new for itself. Even the promotional material for each episode parallels some famous Batman content, and I love it! And I especially love that the intro to the series, the very start of episode 1, is just a huge homage to the iconic intro to the timeless Batman the Animated Series. With my videos, I always make it my goal to not only create a video expressing my thoughts, but an experience expressing my personal feelings. This video is no exception. In fact, I've got some very exciting news. I am very humbled to have been able to get in contact with Anthony Ingruber and Laura Post, the voice actors for John Doe slash The Joker and Harley Quinn, specifically for an exclusive interview for this review. So you'll see little injections of our interviews throughout the critique, and you can view the full interviews I had with them in a separate video on my channel. They were both really cool to talk to, and it's an insightful experience to behold, so I'd really suggest you go check that out. And hey, if you enjoy this video, please help a lad out and share this on whatever social media platform you have. Anything helps, and I'd really, really appreciate it. Now, this is going to be a full critique filled with pretty much everything I have to offer on this game, so consider this a spoiler warning. If for whatever reason you haven't played the game and you're just here along for the ride and you've never played a Telltale game, then the premise is quite simple. It's a storytelling game where you can actively choose your dialogue and key plot interactions to mould the story into a really personal and unique experience. You can choose who to work with, how to treat them, how you behave, and it all services a broader season-long story arc. You have agency over the relationships you can develop with characters and consequently those characters will drive the story. So in the context of Batman, what is the perfect story? This is a question that has stirred fans for years. In fact, if you want to hear my full thoughts and coverage on the psychology of Batman, I made an in-depth video deconstructing his ideology depicted in films. If I can get it to work, there'll be a little title card up in the, in the top right corner. <laughs> I think that the perfect Batman story would be one that delves into the identity of Batman and Bruce Wayne. I think that it would show the personal stakes of his career. It would have compelling and personal villains that the audience could also grow to care about. 
At the heart of it all, it would be a self-contained story about the fundamental aspect of Batman. Choice. See, the storytelling craft of Telltale revolves entirely around these imperative choices, and in doing this, it contrasts Batman's ideology to Bruce's relationships. And to serve as the perfect love letter to the source material, Telltale allows us to define our relationships with these characters. It forces us to truly feel the complications of loyalty and obligation as a toll on not only our protagonist, but us as individuals. So giving that freedom to the player, allowing them to see the fallout of their own actions, no matter how noble their intentions were, expertly showcases the true struggle of the Batman character, and it makes for a remarkable and memorable story. The gameplay is very simple, and it works because it doesn't need to be complicated. This isn't an Arkham game, this is a storytelling game, so any amount of combat featured in the game is played up for cinematic effect, and it works in constructing this theatrical feel. Each successive quick time event fluidly connects to the next, and it emulates that Arkham free flow rhythm in, in my opinion, an equally satisfying way. Because the combat is crafted like this, the game has some leeway in taking theatrical liberties with its fighting. When I say this, I mean that it's intense and stylistic to the point where it's almost credible for the sake of the fight. There are instances few and far between where you can plan out your attacks, and I really enjoy this feature. It plays into that coordinated and thought out approach Batman would take to a fight, and it usually means you have to consider other lives at stake, or the risk of alerting additional enemies. The detective work is involving, and though not a cognitive strain, still enjoyable and immersive. I love piecing together a story and watching it play out according to the evidence left at the crime scene. It's not difficult by any means, but a nice little interactive component to break up the otherwise decisive gameplay. It reminds me of the crime scene analysis mechanic introduced in Batman Arkham Origins, which would see the player review evidence and rewind or play back a crime scene to see it all happen in real time and capture hidden details. Now I'm aware that a lot of people had visual bugs and glitches throughout their playthroughs, however I encountered no such problems across my multiple playthroughs on PC. Just a few months ago I was watching my brother play season 1 for the first time when we noticed certain character models not loading in or particles changing colours for no apparent reason and it's unfortunate because it immediately brings you out of the experience. The music across the two seasons is phenomenal. I love the theme for season 1 and adore the theme for season 2. They reflect the struggle and hardships of Batman, the duality, the deception, manipulation and greyness of morality. I love the theme so much that one of the highlights for me was starting each episode and hearing the familiar theme play behind Bruce's narration because it set the scene remarkably. It pulls you into the story and establishes its tone perfectly. I wear the mask in order to protect this city. But when faced with a new breed of criminals calling themselves the Pact, the direct approach was met with disaster. I had to don a different mask. As Bruce Wayne, I infiltrated their ranks. The plan was to get in, set the trap, and get out. But the plan failed. Now they're one step closer to their goal, and all I have are questions. What is the Pact really after? Why steal Riddler's body? Friend or foe? The overall tone of the game is remarkably consistent between the two seasons. It's dark, serious and gritty, but not overly confronting. Any amount of humour across the seasons are owed to the voice actor's performance and cleverly written witty comedy. They never go out of their way for a joke, they never make a joke with the intent of pulling you out of the moment, but instead to develop chemistry between the characters and keep the story rolling in an engaging way. And I really appreciate that. It's often subtle one-liners or a cheeky play between characters, but it never feels out of place. There's never a moment where I'm left wondering, wow, did Bruce really just say that? That's very out of character for him, and that's simply because the writers understand the characters very, very well. Bruce sometimes has some subtle roasts or charismatic smart guy energy, and sometimes it's more of a personal play on his relationship with the character. The story has all of the conventions of a superhero mystery drama and weaves it all together very well. The pacing of the story itself is phenomenal, no single scene overstays its welcome and each stake is addressed accordingly, and this all contributes to this evolving story as the game progresses. Each interaction introduces or develops something new and interesting and keeps the player hooked. 
That is among my favourite components of the game. It stays interesting for its entire duration. The game normally achieves this by putting you in a situation with someone who has conflicting interests and you have to bounce off of them in a battle of wit. For instance, you pay Mayor Harvey Dent a visit to try and bring him to his senses. The thing that you can both agree on is that the children of Arkham need to be stopped, but fundamentally you are both at odds with the cost, resulting in him despising you and blowing up a city block, killing innocents in the process. The scene is kept engaging because of these interactions and the ultimate climax, and that is where the game performs at its absolute best. The stakes in this game are everything. They are the ultimate culmination of all of these personal developments in the story. I was astounded at how much freedom the player has in forging their own relationships with the characters, how they could pick their moments, choose sides and different ways to approach people. But of course, on the flip side of all of that was the punishment. And if you're as indecisive as me, prepare to get fucked. If everything appears to be going well, something is going to throw a spanner in the works and force you into choosing sides in a battle of morality, truth, and deception. This game really highlighted the struggles of Batman on a level that no other medium has ever achieved. Not the comics, not the movies, not even the other games. But with this story, with this experience, you are Bruce Wayne. You are Batman. Everything you do molds the story in its own way. And I'll be honest, I was initially intimidated by this, but it's not complicated or overly intellectual stuff, it's just layered very intricately, to the point where you're aware of everything going on, and by that point all of the plot seeds have been planted and you've gauged all of the characters, so you can weigh your options and consider the potential benefits or complications with every choice you make. The game expertly plans encounters and payoffs seamlessly. Each and every character you encounter makes a long-lasting impression and the game will always peg you in a battle of truth or loyalty between these characters, and it's incredibly anxious. And that's exactly why it's brilliant. You can connect with these characters exactly as Bruce does, on an emotional level. So when you're faced with these moral dilemmas, when you're forced to choose sides, you experience an anxiety which parallels Bruce's own feelings. This helps you connect with him as a protagonist and understand him, imprint your own moral code onto him and mould him however you like. Either that or I have crippling anxiety. If you want him to be a compassionate hero and a symbol of hope, you can, but at the expense of the fear you may be able to strike into the hearts of villains. If you instead want him to be that brutal, hardened and scary, monstrous vigilante of the night, you can, but at the expense of the public eye and how the police may perceive you. You can even do a combination of both, but at the end of it all, there's a consequence to your every action, and I especially love that every single choice, no matter how big or small, contributes to the narrative in some way. Despite the vast array of characters, Season 1 focuses primarily on Bruce. This is perfect because we have an entire first season dedicated to forging that first impression of Batman and Bruce and seeing his own duality. And to support this sense of duality, we have Two-Face as a villain, Catwoman doubting the goodness in her, and Penguin being a villain as a result of the Wayne's dark past. We can see that Bruce is very early in his career, and this is supported by how we see the characters mould into either enemies or allies. This season is about Bruce and Batman. The villain only supports that by having a mirrored experience with trauma and conflict in their childhood. Through this, we see how similar yet different Batman is from Lady Arkham. The entire first episodes of both seasons are brilliant because they develop this incredibly intriguing story. They plant seeds for character development. We get to learn about the characters and their motivations, their conflicts, their allegiances, and we get to essentially see all of the pieces on the board. After the first interaction with these characters, we know how they'll behave and what drives them. We see how they can get what they want. For example, when we're first introduced to Falcone, we can see that he's very secretive and he does business literally behind closed doors. He's a dangerous man, he's got armed henchmen that work for him, and he's very, very old school. He believes there's strength in numbers, and he immediately tries to make an ally out of you by comparing Bruce to his father. And side note, I really, really love the visual aid of him breaking the billiards balls when he says he keeps people moving. It expertly shows that he has ties everywhere and he oversees everything from behind the curtain, the ultimate symbol of organised crime. It establishes him as a formidable threat and someone who knows their way through the social hierarchy and plants that seed for the subplot about Bruce's father. One of the things I loved about playing the first season, and I mean it carries into the second season too, 
is, you know, when I first started playing the first season and they sort of get into um, the, the history of the Waynes, I was like, mm, I don't know if I like this because I'm I'm very protective of my Batman and my Batman stories. Then I kind of was like, no, I like this. I like this change to his backstory because it gives the player the freedom to sort of tweak Batman's personality or persona in a different kind of an Elseworlds that isn't, you know, because we know what Batman acts like in the comic books with Batman's history and like he's, that's Batman and Batman doesn't do this and Batman would definitely do that. And I mean, I've got strong opinions about what Batman does and doesn't do. But in this world, because they've sort of tweaked his backstory just enough, it gives the player that kind of freedom to be like, well, maybe this Batman wouldn't do that. And maybe this Batman would consider this possibility, you know? Um, which I really liked in the I ended up absolutely adoring the first season and uh, I it carried into the second season so that you know there's just even more gray there's no clear cut like oh well here's the good guy decision and here's the bad guy decision it's really much more about what's your style of being a superhero as a player which is really cool and fun I found this part particularly interesting because coming from that same standpoint I had this sense of gatekeeping complex for how I perceived the Waynes. Growing up with Batman, his parents to me were nothing more than motivation. They existed just to die and propel Bruce into his dark fate as Batman. As far as I was concerned, they were humanitarians that were unfortunately and tragically gunned down in a random street mugging that could have happened to anyone at all. So to have Telltale introduce this almost Peter Parker, secret agent parents type beat to the story with them being involved with the Mafia and consequently assassinated, you can imagine my less than impressed and lesser inclination to collaborate mindset initially from this bombshell. But alas, I found that as it got deeper and deeper into the mystery, it actually served a greater purpose in relating Bruce to the main villain of the season and making him doubt his own mission to then ultimately strengthen his belief in what he does. I am sure it was an intentional stroke of genius from Telltale's part to elicit that exact reaction, knowing that us, as the fans, would naturally want to reject that truth and preserve that holy image of the Waynes, in actuality brought us closer to Bruce in a more personal way, and it made us align with his own values. So when we tried to dispute that his father was a criminal, it felt as though that's exactly something Bruce would do. And I've got to say, out of all of the countless times we've seen the Waynes get murdered, the Telltale one really sticks out to me. I love how two of the three tickets are subtly highlighted and those are the two that Bruce keeps tucked away in the Batcave. Almost like he's purposely abandoned the final third ticket, his ticket, because of his guilt. Another little detail that I appreciate, though maybe not purposeful, is that the photo frame cracks in the shape of a web, all leading into Bruce at the center point. It's a little visual way of further communicating how he blames himself for that night. What immediately heightens the stakes of any good story are secrets. One character having to preserve or shield the truth from another in order to serve a purpose. It plays into that theme of deception. It divides the characters into distinct alliances and can be an incredibly powerful driving force for a story, if used correctly. Selfish doubt is possibly the most dangerous and self-destructive human emotion, and this game plays it to its full advantage. There are times where you need to lie. There are times where you need to hurt people in good conscience in order to protect another. There are even times where you need to lie to someone to protect them from the truth, and sometimes it's so easy to get it wrong. 
For example, there's a moment in Season 2 when I sent Alfred out of the room so he didn't have to watch the horrific footage of Lucius' final moments. I thought I was doing the right thing and sparing him his pain, but in actuality I was prohibiting him from properly grieving, and he felt guilty and like he was a burden. And in some cases, other characters preserving your secrets pit them against their allies and put them in danger. So you've really got to consider who you're going to open up to. On the other hand are the physical stakes, and for the most part they're fine, but leave a bit to be desired. Ultimately, each season falls back on the same cliché, chemical bioweapon threat as the main bad guy's master plan, but that's not the threat you ever care about. At all. Because instead, you're more scared of the villain, rather than the threat that they pose. You know them, you understand them, and to an extent you feel responsible for them, and therefore, it's personal. Though, if any future seasons are ever developed, what I'd like to see is a large-scale physical threat that's equally as terrifying. So far, the closest we've gotten to that might be Bane from Season 2. You're an enemy to him as Batman, but there's a chance to be an ally to him as Bruce. Of course, as Bruce, you're without the safety of the cape and cowl. You have to fall back on your instincts and read him accordingly. Feed off what you think might keep you alive, and to top it all off, Bane plays a huge role in the villain gang, so you've got a personal stake and a physical stake. But again, it's not some huge citywide catastrophe that you have to prevent. I'm honestly all for personal stakes over physical stakes. In fact, I think that it's a problem that many superhero films fall into these days. They focus more on the Grandmaster's plan than developing an actual connection to the Grandmaster. Telltale has done this perfectly over two seasons, and now I can see that I want more. I know that they can give more. Give us a reason to care for the city and its people. Give us a reason to hate the villain on an antagonistic level as well as a personal one. Because Telltale have done the hard part, and they're experts at it. They know how to get in your head and how to make you feel a certain way for a character. If they could just translate it to make an actual monster scale threat, then it would be spectacular. But chemical bioweapons just can't cut it anymore. It's like a safety net or a cliché fallback. It's oversaturated in the superhero genre and I'm positive there are other ways to develop this sense of scale and urgency while doing what they do best. Arkham City did it fairly well. You cared about the Joker and Batman while also fearing the looming threat of this mysterious Protocol 10. And then when Protocol 10 finally hit, it was threatening. What we need, to put it simply, is a reason to care about the city. In Season 1, we got to a point where we kinda did. We cared about how the city felt about us as Bruce Wayne and as Batman. What we need to see is the vulnerability of this desperate city. Gotham is as much a character as anyone else. Gotham may have been built by the people, but it also builds them. So if we could somehow see how much a united city can accomplish, we could see how vulnerable it is, and therein lies our physical stake. That's the crux of the Grandmaster's plan, and it's something that the Dark Knight did pretty well. As a player, our three main concerns for Bruce Wayne are his enemies, his allies, and his public perception. Bruce's public perception is challenged by both his enemies and his allies. Your connections to both of them will often force you to consider a compromise, meaning that you will suffer in the eye of the public for the greater good. And this is best showcased when the allegations of his father are exposed. Because this is a threat to your public perception, you're forced into the enemy's demands. This, in turn, not only has severe consequences for Bruce Wayne, but Batman as well. Meaning that it could also skew the public perception of Batman. This is exacerbated when Bruce is drugged and lashes out at Penguin on live TV. From there, you must build your public perception back up however you like. This duality is what intrigues John when you meet him in Arkham. And as skeptical as you are of him at that point in time, your actions will dictate his perception of you later down the line. So having those multiple layers concerning your allies, enemies, and public perception builds to your experience in heightening the stakes of each interaction. Because now you're thinking about your relationship with them, what power they potentially have, if they're in actuality on your side, what your actions could do to them, and how that affects the broader outlook on yourself. And this mirrors your playstyle as Batman. However, instead, you have fear on your side, and you can use it to intimidate the corrupt criminals of Gotham and establish yourself as a dangerous symbol. Or, you can be a merciful, lawful symbol of hope. But either commitment has repercussions. You can do what the police can't, and they'll hate you for that. 
or you can abide by their rules and the villains won't fear you. There's a point in Season 1 where you can choose to brutalise a thug or be merciful. Brutalising them will get you the information you need to forward the case, however will be seen as an act of villainy from Commissioner Gordon. If instead you choose to be merciful, you might not get the information you need, but Gordon will respect your methods more and will be in a better position to aid you later on, which may even be the better option when he has vital information that he could potentially share with you. Batman's public perception is a dilemma of identity. You must forge that path for Batman. You must go out and see what works because his symbolism is the very core of why he exists. My favorite aspect of the game is everything we've already been talking about. It's the character interactions and through your decisions of how you interact with characters, watch those characters develop. There are people whose lives can be saved or destroyed just because of what seemed like at the time innocuous decisions you made. The writing in these games is just always my favorite part for sure. I mean, it's just really good storytelling and you get really invested. And like I said, the other, my other favorite part is that there aren't, it's not a clear cut decision of like, here's your renegade choice and here's your moral choice. What are you? Are you a good person or a bad person? Go. And you, and, and there's a timer. So it's not like you get to sit in him and haw about it either. You know, you have to, it, it's, it feels, it feels kind of like a simulation of being a, like a superhero simulation. It's fun to play pretend in those worlds. And that's what I feel like when you're playing a Telltale game, you're playing pretend. The freedom Telltale allows us in playing as Bruce means we can play the game a number of ways. We can play the game as closely and as accurately to the character of Batman as possible, or we can imprint our own values and beliefs onto our protagonist. We can be stern, isolated and brutal, yet compassionate like he typically is. Or we might be more inclined to be reasonable, lenient and open as per our own personality. And the game certainly isn't forgiving. If you want to play the game as though you are the protagonist, then you will morally suffer the most from your actions. If you play it like Batman typically is, you might encounter a whole different range of problems for better or worse. But where the game shines brightest is where it connects you, as the player, closer to Bruce by seemingly making his problems your problems. How? by making you feel the same emotion toward the characters as he does. Like him, you're compassionate for Harvey Dent. You believe Selina can be a better person. You want to believe Thomas Wayne is innocent. You want to try and be a good role model to John, and you're somewhat scared, somewhat turned on by Harley Quinn. <laughs> Just me. Is that supposed to be funny? By doing this, Telltale essentially makes you feel like Batman. You actually feel the cost of his actions, you see the humanity and brutality in his emotions, and you connect to the characters just as he does. So, at its core, what this game excels at best is conflict. You can choose how to talk to people, how to behave as Batman or as Bruce Wayne, how to treat your allies and your enemies, and those confrontations are entirely in your control. You are responsible for your actions. Wait, what? Oh god, no! Oh, no, Harvey, god, no, 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 back on Selena! She could die! I wonder what she's gonna do. She's gonna die. She's gonna die. She's gonna die. Oh my god. You know what? Suddenly I'm not so sure I love these choices. Actually, that's a lie. I do love them, but only because I hate them. Because they can turn good people cruel. <laughs> they can make you feel responsible for absolutely nothing at all, or something that literally isn't in your control for trying to make the best out of a bad situation. It makes you question whether or not you made the right choice, and that is the crux of this story. Subjectively making the right call. You define your experience. Telltale have taken the storytelling essential of cause and effect and placed it completely in our hands. Your actions dictate the story, and that's where the emotion comes in, because now, as the player, you have a complete emotional stake in the story. And I think this is what Season 2 does best. It takes those emotional stakes and it weaves them between characters like a tight thread and then you have to choose who is strangled and who is spared. And this is the biggest threat to someone as indecisive as me. The stakes aren't created by the events that happen. They're about the people you encounter, the people you care about, the people you fear, the people you despise. Every character in this game has some kind of emotional bind to you as the player. Consequently, they are important, and they mean something either good or bad. Even the characters you don't care about actually mean something. In Season 2, I didn't save Iman Avesta from Riddler's Death Trap because I care about her. I did it because that's what Batman does. He saves people. 
and in that, I gave Avesta something more valuable than any amount of technology or weaponry. I gave her something to believe in. So when my guard was down, and I had nowhere to go, Avesta was able to play an advantage because she truly saw what we saw. She believed in the mission, just as Batman does. Just as we do. Catwoman exists in this game to bring out our hopeful side. She's as slippery, untrustworthy, sultry, and bold as ever. Despite her typical characterization, we want her to be better because we believe she can be. Similarly, we also believe in Harvey Dent. He's Gotham's white knight, Bruce's closest friend, and you wholeheartedly want him to succeed. So now your stakes are more personal when you're trading the trust of your best friend in exchange for the partnership and affection of your love interest. Harvey Dent is entirely this game's embodiment of duality. It's always about pushing and pulling until something inevitably breaks. Those children of ours can jump me. God, it's only getting worse. It's out of control. I can't stop it. This can't continue. What are you going to do to stop it? Not enough. Never enough. Harvey Dent does everything by the book to the letter of the law. But that isn't working. Sure it is. He's turning things around. Barely. Slowly. I'd like to see you do better. Watch me. Now are you gonna fix this mess? Simple. Easy. Curfews after dark. Checkpoints at every bridge. Mandatory identification cards. 24-7 video surveillance. No. Harvey, snap out of it. We all need to snap out of it! Sorry. Sorry about that, Bruce. I guess I got a little lost there. This whole friendship not only can jeopardize each other's interactions, but also Bruce's public perception. You can choose to make Dent look better and brighter at your own expense, but he can also make you look shady and deceptive if you choose to shut him out. So even though you're friends, you're constantly working against each other in a battle of not only public perception, but for your own agendas, and it creates an uneasy conflict between you two because you're caught between doing the right thing by him, but also the right thing for yourself and the good of others. This is kind of the perfect scenario for Two-Face to be created. He's among all of this deception, fake faces, misplaced loyalty and betrayal from political, personal and emotional standpoints. The dynamic between Bruce, Catwoman and Harvey Dent is entirely loyalty versus love. So now you've got this simple love triangle which forces you to pick sides. You can choose whether or not Harvey Dent becomes disfigured, but the problem with Harvey has never been the physical scars, it's always been the mental ones. The scars only reflect the psychological duality that binds him to chance and allows his coin to dictate his actions. So scar or not, Dent is still a broken man. He is still betrayed. He is still deceived. It just goes to show that the only truly ugly thing about him wasn't the physical scarring, but instead the monster you've allowed him to become. In this story, the scars now just serve as a monument to your failure, and in the end, it is still heartbreaking. I chose Harvey. Really weird playing through the game when you choose Harvey, as a side note, because you save him so he doesn't have the, like, damage. <laughs> but everything still kind of goes through as though he did. It's, it's a little weird. I still liked it. It wasn't a problem in the writing. It was just sort of like when I made that decision and then watching the rest of the story play out, it was one of those like, I feel like maybe I was supposed to go for Selena. Not that I had an inferior experience having chosen Harvey, but it was just sort of like, oh, I see how this would play out vice versa. You feel frustrated because you're like, I'm doing everything I can and why, why? Well, but the thing is that happens in real life too. I've had friends where it's like, I'm trying so hard to help you and you were just being very self-destructive and I don't know what else to do except sort of watch and try to mitigate the damage and that's, it's a very good interpretation of that feeling when you're playing through season one. But it's just, that's not the way the world always works. It's a thing in Telltale games, but it's a thing I love because it's a thing in life. Like, you think you're doing the right thing, and then it's like, oh, well, guess that that's not how I expected that person to react to that choice. But that was what I said, and, well, now I have to deal with trying to fix it 
after the fact. What's going on? I just came by to check on Selena. What, with your pants off? Back off, Harvey. Don't! Don't touch me! I thought I would come here and... <sighs> so stupid! God, I should have known. I should have known that you would do this to me! Oh, Bruce. <laughs> Please, not with him. But I can't. Oh, God, I can't listen to him. You're not alone. We're right here. Okay? Yeah, I am. I am. I am. My fault. Harvey, don't. Bruce, I... I don't think we can help him. Not on our own. It's just me. It's just me. It's just me. It's just me. He's my friend, Selena. I'm not going to abandon him. He needs professional help. Help you can't give him. It's okay, Bruce. I'll go. I don't deserve your help. Go off with your tail between your legs. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Harvey! That was when I felt like I had truly betrayed him. That was the last straw for him, when all he had left was us two, and to see the two of us deceiving him right in front of his eyes, that was the breaking point. All of my efforts to convince him that he could still be the man he was were now completely futile. This betrayal would force any lingering compassion out of his heart, and this new ugly darkness would consume him. That sounds like a line from Kingdom Hearts, but I, I swear I just wrote that. That was when he became Two-Face. That is when I created Two-Face. We were good friends once, Bruce. I'm glad you're here. At the end. Maybe you can remember me the way I was before. Before him. Bruce, I need... I need the result! Drop the damn coin! Without the coin, I can't... I, I can't... If you insist. <laughs> Bruce... I don't know... I don't know what to do. I can't decide. It's too much. It's too much. I can't. A safer Gotham, Harvey. Just like you wanted. Alfred acts as the voice of reason between the two seasons. He's a father figure to Bruce and is constantly trying to guide you down the right path. He often does this by drawing comparisons to Bruce's father, and this theme of fatherhood is echoed throughout the two seasons. I love that Alfred challenges you on your morals and your identity of Batman, and because this exists within a game entirely dependent on your own choices, the message actually gets through. You can honestly consider the consequences and weigh your options. You can step back and look at everything that you have done to forward your own agenda, and his words can put things into a genuine perspective. And I think this is where that emotional and personal connection between player and protagonist blends the best. That is why Telltale is so perfect at what they do, or what they did. The medium of video games can do what no other medium can. It makes the consumer more than just a stakeholder, it makes them responsible. It allows them to play as they wish, and Alfred makes you conscious of that. He criticizes you for having that chance to make your own decisions, which inherently is something both in and out of your own control. Because the game cannot progress without your input, but also will force you into situations where you have no input, or rather forces you to use that input to make a critical choice with destructive consequences. So when Alfred scolds you for it, you feel responsible and the message hits right home. So you, you have to decide to give up Batman or give up Alfred and I'm like but how do you you can't be Batman without Alfred everything else you've done in the game already hurts 
but you kind of see it come, you know, you like, you know, even when you pick vigilante Joker, you know, it's not going to turn out well, you know, he's still Joker. It's just very unfortunate. It's a really, really hard decision to make. It's the hardest decision in any of the games, I think. And it's rough. And then it's like the last one you make and then the game's over and you're just sort of sitting there like, but who will remember this? Every superhero story needs to have a big bad, and the two central antagonists of the series are Lady Arkham in Season 1 and the Joker in Season 2, though I'll get to the latter later. Though Lady Arkham doesn't initially seem as compelling a villain as Two-Face, she's a slow burn, to me at least. Piecing together the story of how she was conditioned to be the way she is was frightening and quite tragic and puts in perspective how similar Bruce is to her. Both characters were done wrong by their father and allowed their trauma and vengeance to twist them into something fearful and therefore wear symbolic masks to reflect their pain. Vicky Vale's deception really highlights the danger you can put yourself in by placing your trust in the wrong person. I'd honestly argue that Lady Arkham is an incredibly formidable opponent to Batman. Not only can she ruin his public image and turn the police against him as Batman, but as a very skilled fighter. The entire final boss battle had me in awe and perfectly showcases how Telltale's simple quick time fighting style emphasizes the cinematic experience for the player. It shows how evenly matched they are and consequently how they rely on quick thinking, ingenuity and intense reflexes. I appreciate that Telltale forced us to deal with the citywide stakes earlier so that when we have our final showdown with Lady Arkham, the only stakes that matter are the personal ones. You don't care about her planning to release the Arkham inmates, you care about what she could do to Alfred. It gives you that drive to actually defeat her and makes you carefully consider your dialogue choices to seem compassionate and reasonable in the hopes that no harm would befall Bruce's father figure, because by that point we care about him just as much as Bruce. Vicky's supposed death is as comic-like and traditional as it could get, and I honestly like that. In the end, her hatred consumed her, and she died on that hill. I say supposed, because I believe that there may be a very real chance that she survived. Season 2, however, is where Telltale takes everything great about Season 1 and improves it tenfold! While Season 1 focuses on Bruce, Season 2 focuses on the people around him and is consequently about empathy versus loyalty above all else. The true stakes and the true dilemmas come from his enemies and allies, so having the story focused almost completely on them is perfect. The way that I played Season 2 had Bruce be undercover almost the entire time and I loved every second of it. Episodes 2, 3, and 4 are my favourites in the entire series because you're knee-deep in the shit with the villains and you can't blow your cover. This season had so little screen time of Batman that it made you really value your choices as Bruce and made you fear your dilemmas as Batman. From a personal standpoint, you are forced to choose between your own morality and maintaining your cover. The same situation from Season 1 reappears where you have to make an impression on Bane. The villains suspect a mole is in their ranks and Bane thinks he's found a likely suspect. To prove your loyalty to the gang, you can choose to brutalize the suspected mole or be merciful. Each action has their own consequence. Being merciful is seen as a sign of weakness, whereas being brutal is seen as loyal. Like Bane, Harley saw my lack of empathy and commitment to loyalty as a strength, however I felt really bad about it. There's an entire dynamic built around empathy versus loyalty. I love the danger and opportunities being undercover introduces. You can connect with the villains, gain their trust, and they'll put you in charge of operations. From there you can dismantle it from the inside and they won't suspect you. However, it's at the cost of your morally courageous companions such as Alfred, Tiffany, and Gordon. Working with Waller gives you an advantage, but you have to be willing to get blood on your hands and play your cards right to maximize your efficiency with her. She can trust you and forgive you for your behavior for the greater good of your actions, and even though it compromises your relationship with Gordon, he may still forgive you and remain on your side in the end. You can allow someone to be burdened by their guilt, or you can be a mentor to them and show them they can be better. Amanda Waller can be a powerful ally or a formidable opponent, so you're pegged between your loyalty and partnership with Commissioner Gordon and your obligation to the mission. Because by that point you know the importance of your journey and you have the trust of a great ally, but you have to make that choice of what is more important. What is expendable? How will you be able to work around either decision? How will this benefit or jeopardize future interactions? There's so many layers to this one rivalry. 
If you abide by Waller's demands, but make it clear that you also work on your own terms, she will come to respect you, and with that you will have more leeway into how you do things. In my case, by the end of it all, due to this symbiotic relationship I had established with her, I was able to clean Selena's crime record, get Avesta her dream job at Wayne Enterprises, and reinstate Gordon as commissioner. However, I fear that if you decided to work with Gordon instead, all of that wouldn't be available to you. It might even be harder to remain undercover. I enjoyed Tiffany's character, but the main thing that I found really compelling was the fact that she killed Riddler. With Tiffany, I needed to be assertive and tell her how badly she screwed up. I needed to tell her that taking another life was and is never an option. I needed her to feel like absolute shit so the message could really get drilled into her. But it hurt. You don't want to blame them, because had I been in her shoes, I'd be tempted to do the same. You don't want to make them feel bad for that. You understand her grief, and it's hard to not sympathize with her. But you need to make them aware of their mistake, or they might be prone to make it again, or even worse, think that they can act without consequence. And all of this is dependent on how you know the character will act. For example, Tiffany was fairly arrogant and hot-headed for almost every interaction I had with her, and for good reason. I knew that she often acted and spoke off impulse and emotion without a thought filter, so I decided to do exactly that and approach her with ignorance and arrogance in telling her that killing is wrong. Once I knew that she understood, I offered to take her under my wing. That way I could teach her how to productively channel those emotions. I made it clear that her working with Batman wasn't going to be fun, but instead a chance to redeem herself and learn the right way. And it paid off in a happy ending. GCPD and the agency are slammed with everything that's happening. You'll be fighting on your own. I'm never alone out there. I've always had someone watching over me. It's similar with Gordon. You can work to his rules and abide by his nobility and make him into a great ally. You can get to the point where he can even admit, I don't like what you're doing, but I know that whatever it is, it's for the right reason. And he'll be more susceptible and lenient to allowing you to work your own way. But if you abuse that privilege and continue to work outside the law, he will antagonize you and turn on you. It's an incredibly simple formula to understand, but an insanely complex formula to manipulate. Bane and Mr. Freeze are the personification of loyalty. Both are loyal to the mission due to their own ends, however Mr. Freeze's loyalty comes from a place of genuine love, whereas Bane's comes from a place of respect. The mission where you tried to convince Bane to like you was like walking on eggshells. I felt like if I didn't say the right thing, he would kill me, and saying the right thing didn't necessarily mean saying what he wants to hear, because he respects integrity as much as he respects loyalty, so it was a tough line to walk. As well as earning his trust, you also need to stick to your own moral code. There are several times where I would purposely get in his way and knock out the people he was targeting to spare them from a gruesome death. In the end, Bane came to really like me and respected me. He liked that I could speak my mind against him, but also respected my loyalty. Bane is the embodiment of that loyalty in this game, and Telltale really made an effort of showing the stakes of commitment, and how easily those ties are severed if you make just one mistake. Unfortunately, Mr. Freeze is the other side of that coin. I feel like I didn't have nearly as strong a relationship with him that I did with Bane, John, and Harley, but that's fine. Ironically, talking with Freeze was like skating on thin ice. He didn't trust me initially, but managed to slowly connect with me through a shared admiration for gadgets and technology. This came to a head in episode 5 when I chose to help him in return for information. Something that really rubbed me the wrong way initially was the fact that we saw Mr. Freeze as more of a bloodthirsty villain rather than a compassionate yet unbridled anti-villain like he typically is. But that can, again, be owed to this Elseworlds-style story that Telltale has created. After all, if I just wanted to see the Mr. Freeze from the animated series or the Arkham games, I'd just go watch them. So really, it was nice to see his character tackled from an ever so slightly new perspective. I have it on good authority that a large portion of Season 2 was written and rewritten or cut and moved around, so I'm interested in just what content was cut. I wouldn't be surprised if Mr. Freeze had some more screen time that unfortunately didn't make the final cut, and I wonder what context any scenes featuring him would have further developed his character. At the end of it all, each villain had noble intentions for getting the virus as per their master plan. Freeze wanted it so he could work it into a cure and save his wife. Bane wanted it to cure his own Titan addiction, and Harley wanted it to save her own sanity. 
The villains of Season 2 were just as threatening as anything you had faced thus far and added more stakes to your slowly increasing ensemble of benefits and consequences. Almost every single situation you're ever put in in the entire series will always end with something good, something bad, and something ugly. Sometimes they'll all be the worst, but rarely they'll all be the best. Bruce's relationship with Catwoman in this season is perhaps more meaningful than ever before. It's uneasy, because you reunite under almost a completely different alias. You might favour loyalty over morality to preserve the integrity of your operation, and it shocks her. John's love for Harley positions him to connect with Bruce on a more emotional, brotherly-like level. You can choose to shut Catwoman out and potentially make her into your enemy and go it solo, or you can let her back into your life for a really unique experience. In episode 3, if you tell her to stop with the games and really confront her with the severity of your life, you'll inevitably shut her out. However, if you allow her to help you and you genuinely place your trust in her, it's almost like an entirely different story. The same things happen, but it's just a completely different experience. You can return to the Batcave with Selina and continue the investigation with her. You'll have the choice to really delve back into that love Bruce had developed with her while reminiscing your first encounter with her in Season 1, and arguably the best part of this choice is that you get a really heartwarming response from Alfred, who tells you he's happy to see you two back again. If he remains the stern, isolated Batman that he is, you wouldn't get this opportunity, and you would instead return to the Batcave otherwise unoccupied. This inclusion of the little moments of heart versus the moments of cold isolation make all the difference. It brilliantly highlights the contrasting effects of letting people into your life as Bruce. However, of course, it comes at a cost because it may be more difficult to convince the villains that your relationship is strictly platonic. The only person you can really open up to is John, but of course, in doing so, Selina becomes a target during the villain ending. I'm a huge fan of Harley Quinn. After watching Batman the Animated Series, I found her character really fun and endearing, and after reading Mad Love, I really liked the actual depth to her character. She's not this one-dimensional, overly sexualized henchman and girlfriend of the Joker, and Telltale really took this and made it unique, and if I'm being honest here, this is my favorite interpretation of the character. I initially found it very jarring that she was already Harley Quinn and that she had some pulls in the crime underbelly of Gotham, but it grew on me, and I can truly say that I love it. I had always always wanted to work with Telltale because I had been a fan of theirs for a really long time. <laughs> so uh, it was really, really cool as a DC fangirl to get to be such an iconic character in the DC universe. Um, and it, it was a little overwhelming. I cannot say that I wasn't nervous. They were an incredible group to work with as an actor. I felt like they spent a lot of time with us as actors, just making, not just, you know, making sure we, they got like the read they needed, but like making sure that we all had the read that made sense for the character in the context. And, uh, you know, they, they weren't afraid to like play around with lines and sort of tweak them on the fly and come back and revisit things after we'd like gone forward just to make sure that it was really the exact right performance and also it's one of the few companies that I've ever worked with that um, has had us do any kind of partner or group records so for my second or third Harley Quinn session I actually had me in with Troy doing Bruce so that we could play off of each other which was really really like a, a pure luxury in the world of video games I've never worked with a partner in a video game before only um, only in animation have I had group records or partner records so that was really really cool they cared a great deal about the performance and the writing and getting it just right there's not an immense amount of depth to her character in Season 2, and what glimpses we can see of her life as a psychiatrist is, for the most part, quickly dismissed. But I'd confidently argue that this is one of the very few cases where that depth simply doesn't need to be there. At least, not at this point in the story. She exists as a threatening, dangerous force that you want to impress not only to save your own skin, but also so you can get closer to spoiling her master plan. I actually really love her introduction scene. It immediately shows that she's a threat and someone you need to work at to impress and gain her trust. I like how the very first interaction we have with her after being threatened is when she sends John out to get a slushy and she has a one-on-one -on -one with Bruce where she essentially admits that she's using John. Heartbreaking but intriguing. It made me feel uncomfortable and as if I was treading on eggshells. 
It was interesting to see this side of their relationship, which had been up until this point throughout the mainstream media, the complete opposite. We always knew Harley as the one who was obsessed with the Joker. We knew the Joker was the manipulative and abusive one. Yet here, it's the complete opposite. And it works so very, very well. What I find interesting about Harley Quinn is that she's just had so many, she has so many different iterations in um, comics and the cartoons and film. And each one is valid and completely like unique and different it has like its own little like spin my favorite thing about her is the sort of unpredictability of her as a character i feel like that's a through line for every iteration of harley quinn is that you don't ever really know exactly what's going to pop out of her that's um, something she kind of has in common with joker i like characters that make you laugh and harley always is good for a laugh <laughs> I'm a pretty big fan of Batman and the Batman universe and like DC in general. So I had seen quite a few different iterations of Harley Quinn over the years. Batman the Animated Series is my favorite TV show of all time. So, you know, um, I, I was pretty familiar with her. Um, familiar with her enough, in fact, that when I got the audition, I was like, well, I'm not going to get this. So I sort of just did my own thing with it which I guess worked out in the end. <laughs> uh, what I found really interesting in the audition sides is that in a way she, she was more cunning, she was more manipulative, she was a little bit more strategic in the choices she was making, in the words that she was saying, and the things she was doing in the audition sides, I felt like. She still had that like showmanship aspect. I mean, obviously she's still Harley Quinn, she's still putting on clown makeup and she's making a big, pro big production of it, but there were parts in the audition sides where I was like, Oh, here's where she's just like a real person that's really just over everything else going on around her. So I kind of let a bit of that sneak in and I felt like those moments were really what kind of created this Harley Quinn for Telltale. She's all fun and games until she's not all fun and games <laughs> anymore, you know? The other thing I really liked about Telltale's Harley Quinn that I also think kind of came through in the audition sides was that you never actually know where is her real her like it's like oh she's being vulnerable in this moment but is she is that really her or is she doing it to manipulate me because she she was really I mean she's a, a psychologist she was a very smart lady and you're not even sure if she's telling the truth or not Arlene Sorkin is just, I mean, she originated the character. She is, as far as I'm concerned, she is Harley Quinn. And everybody else is just sort of riffing on what she created along with Paul Dini. There's something to be said for being sort of set free by not holding yourself to any expectations, I guess. <laughs> Harley is, of course, the main antagonist for episodes two through to four of season two. During my first playthrough of season 2, I made it my goal to stick as close to her as possible. I would abide by her demands, rarely oppose her to maintain my cover, and flirt with her wherever applicable, and in the end she came to really like me and trust me. There are moments where she'll go to smash someone's head in with her hammer, and you can punch the person instead to knock them out and spare them that brutal death. And she'll notice this, but because you're still technically brutalizing them, she'll just disregard it as a bloodlust. Time to paint this place red, Brucey boy. No, let me handle this. <clears throat> Can I help you? Uh, we're here for a massage. Couples massage? Nothing too vigorous. We need to save our energy for, uh, other activities. Sorry, looks like we're all booked up. You'll need to return some other time. Maybe call ahead first. Maybe a little cash would make things go smoother. Cash? Sure. Just look the other way. Take a smoke break. Ugh. This has taken too long. We should have just taken him out. Let me call my manager. He's packing! <laughs> hey! Nicely done. For a second there, I thought you'd really gone chicken. Sorry, looks like we're all booked up. You'll need to return some other time. Maybe call ahead first. We're very busy, so you'll need to be leaving now. Not bad, Bruce. 
I give you an A for effort, but a C for style. And if you play your cards right, you can completely divert Tiffany as a target for Harley. You can make Harley relate to Bruce in respecting their fathers. I thought Harley would hate her father for some unknown reason, but I took a gamble that calling him a good man would pay off, and alas, it was the right call. She liked her father, and liked Bruce even more for respecting that. But again, these actions can actually make John grow jealous. It can contribute to this growing hatred and sense of betrayal he harbours for you. The final call of episode 3, the one about admitting who the rat was, I went against the far majority and threw Catwoman under the bus. This meant that I went to the black site with the villains. They all trusted me at this point, and it was awesome! If you go as Bruce with the villains, you can get into the black site undetected and spare many potential victims. Again, even when you're fighting, you can get in Bane's way and knock out people before he can tear them to shreds. As a bonus, you can flirt with Harley, and do some really cool combos with the villains, and honestly, this is the route that I actually prefer. Rod's fire, I'll do the rest. <laughs> But again, it's at the expense of Catwoman. Not only that, but John admits that he's afraid Harley will cut and run, which she eventually does. It shows more of his concern for those around him, and I really appreciate that. Of course, if you take the fall as the mole instead of Catwoman, Harley will feel betrayed and lock you in a freeze chamber. John will feel guilty before leaving you to die with the others. Once you escape, you head to the black side as Batman instead. Only on my second playthrough, when I decided to admit that I was the rat to save Catwoman, did I realise that my initial choice to throw her under the bus actually saved a lot of people from bloodshed. Because without being there with the villains as Bruce, you couldn't take those really subtle measures to ensure those lives were saved, so when you turn up as Batman, needless destruction and violence has already ensued, and the villains have almost completed their plan. Catwoman teams up with you and you take them down. John's guilt from before consumes him and he helps Batman fight. One of the really hard decisions in the game is that, you know, you can choose to go to the black site with the pact or save Selina. And yeah, you can save Selina, but a lot of people die if you don't, because if you go with the pact, you can sort of keep them from causing too much damage because at that point in the game, you know Harley. You know she's not exactly a fan of moderation. So you can go and sort of keep them in check, but then you're gonna sacrifice your lover, partner, who knows what exactly your relationship with Catwoman is at that point. Uh, and that's a really hard decision to make and a really Batman decision to make. Cause that's like the other thing that's really nice is that it's like, those are the kind of decisions that you see in really good Batman stories where it's like, ooh, decide between like the one person that I really care about or the better, the greater good, the more lives, you know, that sort of thing. A good Batman storytelling. I found this whole dynamic amazing, and later in episode 5, if you take the vigilante route, Harley is captured along with Bane for the Suicide Squad or Task Force X. And I found it neat that you can persuade Harley that the Suicide Squad is just using her and she won't ever be in charge. She doesn't really have the power she thinks she does, and she's just being used to do Waller's dirty work. On the other hand, the villain route, Harley falls in love with John, who is now the Joker, and you get the more typical twisted dynamic between them. Just a whole lot less abusive, because there's genuine love there. A little thing that I'd love to see improved on in potential future seasons, if they're ever put in production, is perhaps a subtle visual mechanic where Harley's hair is either covering her eye or pinned behind her hair, depending on whether or not she trusts you. All in all, I love Harley Quinn's new design. Physically, it pays homage to the previous looks while distinctly establishing itself as the telltale look. And I really, really like Laura Post's performance. In the audition sides, you know, like I said, there were a couple things where I was like, oh, that seems like a sort of a different a place where I can do something different than what I think of as classic Harley Quinn. But it was, when I actually went in to record, it was so much different from, you know, I didn't realize that it was like, I mean, I guess I must have had, because I had played the original game, so I knew that John Doe was already in it, but uh, I didn't realize exactly how much they were gonna kind of um, flip that relationship dynamic on its head, which was really fun to work with, to not be like all about Mr. J all the time, but instead, mm -hmm 
have him following me around. <laughs> I did not realize that uh, it was gonna be Harley kind of making Joker into Joker. Well, along with Bruce, depending on what routes you take. Um, I didn't realize it was gonna sort of, we were gonna play off that dynamic as opposed to Harley actually being a henchman, quote, quote, to Joker. It's Joker's more of a henchman, quote, quote, to Harley, which was really cool and fun. And uh, I liked the, the power dynamic between her and Bruce and John. Uh, there's, that, there's a scene back at the, the Pact, at the headquarters for the Pact, where like Harley is like, hey, quit playing with my toys. <laughs> and it's, it's like, a, I really liked that scene. That was really fun to work on. I thought her dynamic as a criminal before meeting the Joker was very intriguing and it paid off expertly. It makes me wonder what it would have been like if the roles were reversed for John and Harley. What if Telltale adhered to the tradition of their relationship? In season one, instead of Dr. Leland treating John, we could have gotten Dr. Harley and Quinzel. Just like we all know, she would have been the impressionable one that we all care about and trying to save her from the Joker. The same dynamic of love and loyalty would have remained, and we still would have seen her go mad and turn evil in the end. It would have been awesome for sure, but that's just the story we know. Telltale has brought us the opposite, and it's just as, if not more, compelling. And this just goes to show how good the writing team at Telltale are. They took away the fundamental aspect of two of the most well-known comic book characters of all time and gave them a completely new characterization. And honestly, I believe that it exceeded the source material with its emotional impact and storytelling. If you have decades of content all showing the typical correct adaption of these characters, then to completely recontextualize them is a huge risk and it paid off better than people give it credit for. And not for lack of liking it, but because so many people, like me initially, don't bother to actually play the game, and consequently they're the ones who are missing out. So yeah, I've got to give a wholehearted kudos to Telltale for taking one of my favourite characters of all time, flipping it on its head, and somehow making it the most likeable adaption of the character for me. Well, does it feel good? You like this? The welcoming committee has really gone downhill around here, hasn't it? What the? Rude! Churlish! Not nice! How do you like it? You are pathetic! Who? Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, the character's 90 years old, I think. Um, and ironically, he's still timeless. Like, it, it's a character that hasn't really aged because he's been interpreted so many different ways. So it's so interesting that a, a villain like that, which is on paper quite quite simple, you know, a, a clown, um, kind of, uh, has become so complex and, and his origin stories are open to so many different interpretations. And I think that it lends itself to being ambiguous, which I think, you know, makes him so iconic as well, because you can have so many different versions of this one character. Now, this isn't the Joker. Well, not yet. This is John Doe. For those who are unfamiliar with that name, John Doe is a default name given to people whose identity is unknown or unconfirmed. During season two, John mentions that he doesn't recall anything at all before his time at Arkham. He's a completely blank slate. And I actually really love this because it ties into the whole origin complex surrounding Joker. That is, that he is an unreliable narrator and continually twisting his stories to gain the advantage. After all, he lied to gain empathy from a certain Dr. Harleen Quinzel and she fell desperately in love with him. But that's the story we all know. Telltale, however, opted for an entirely new one. So, Telltale takes that ambiguity of his origin and really commits to the idea of him not even knowing who he really is. The entire character of John is probably my favourite interpretation of the Joker ever. He's so monumentally different from all other iterations that it really defines his character as unique to the story, and I love that! He's somebody completely new, and yet at the same time he's someone you're completely familiar with. Or so it seems. A real standout for me is the voice actor, Anthony Ingruber. My god, I had never heard of this guy before, but he's managed to create quite possibly the creepiest, most heartbreaking voice for the character I've ever heard. 
For me, he's up there with the likes of Mark Hamill, Troy Baker, and John DiMaggio as the definitive voices of the Joker. I have nothing but absolute respect for that guy. Also, he played Johnny Quick in LEGO DC Supervillains? What? I love that game! Anthony was the perfect casting for this iteration of the Joker, and Gruber's Joker lends itself completely to the whole theme of John being a ticking time bomb. You'll know he'll explode eventually, but it's the subtle anticipation leading up to that moment that is ingrained throughout his performance. And hey, while I'm still on the topic, Troy Baker was a phenomenal Batman. He can juggle the charisma and coldness of Bruce and the gruffness of Batman so, so well. I thought he was outstanding as the Joker in Arkham Origins, so it's nice to see him play the hero. Baker has voiced Batman, Joker, Harvey Dent, Two-Face, Robin, Brainiac, Sinestro, Hawkman, Nightwing, Music Meister, Adam, Hush, Killamoth, Trickster, Superman, Thomas Wayne, and the Arkham Knight. Wow, talk about range. And that's just his DC credits. Anyway, back to the critique. The player's entire relationship with John is centered around our knowledge of his true nature and what he will inevitably become. John is the socially inept, kind-spirited and well-intentioned friend of Bruce. Yeah, he's a little rough around the edges, but you want him to be better. Telltale went that extra mile to make John endearing. They made you desperately want to wish that he wouldn't go bad. How? Easy. They made him impressionable. He went out with a bang, right? Well, that's one of the things that I like was that his, his total lack of self-awareness and social norms. And I think that's what people found endearing about him as well. Like he, he did it from a, it came from a good place, like giving a get well card at a funeral. Uh, you know, not something that I would recommend, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> something that, um, uh, yeah, that, that, that scene I think, from the early on uh, established the mindset of the character for me. Like, like going forward, I was like, okay, that's, it comes from a good place, like everything he does, no matter how messed up it is. Um, and uh, that sort of perpetual victimhood that he had, even when he's found in a sea of bodies with his fingerprints everywhere. I think that, that that adds the ambiguity of like, maybe it was an accident or maybe they did jump him and it was self-defense. It would be cool to do like a, you know, to see the game through John's eyes, like to see what happened, like in between the parts that Bruce sees. I think they cut quite a bit of it, but he talked about how um, a mother hamster, you have to separate it because she'll eat the uh, babies or something. And he's like, it's not, it doesn't make her evil, it's just in her nature or something like that. But there was a monologue like that, um, which, so yeah, you would go from, something innocent and cute like eating frappes is something really dark um which i found yeah i think that was that was what made it uh, interesting for me as an actor to play that the, the story that i think it um coincides the most with would be like frank miller's dark knight returns i think that uh that sort of um codependency relationship between batman and joker was played up i think with the telltale version i think that's the closest in terms of uh, that, that portrayal of the relationship. They made him want to be whatever Bruce encourages him to be. He is the physical manifestation of our choices. They gave him motives to serve conflicting allegiances, one to Bruce and another to Harley, one from loyalty and friendship, another from love. At its core, those are both incredibly compelling driving forces behind characters. So to place him in a moral stalemate, where he must choose one over the other, can make or break him. It can forge him into a flawed hero, or into a ruthless villain. We know that even though he may be naive and impressionable, he has incredibly dark impulses lying just beneath the surface. We know the potential he has to become a monster, so every interaction with him is like treading on eggshells. Not because we fear he'll lash out and kill us, but because we fear that if we say or do the wrong thing just once, if we compromise our morals just one time, it will teach him to do the same. He is so reliant on us that we are responsible for what he becomes, villain or vigilante. I mean, even to a casual viewer, you have to admit that the, the season one Joker is totally different from season two. When I get out of here, you're gonna owe me a favor, okay? Just one. 
I'm not doing any favors for you, John. And here I thought we were getting along so well. We can keep working on our friendship when we meet again, can't we? <laughs> I couldn't stand it. You were there, and, and I was here. I was on my way. Well, I was getting to get on my way. Look, I, I put on shoes. You know, this was my first voiceover role professionally. I'd, I'd never done professional voiceover before for, for any kind of AAA title, except for a few indie things and self-made stuff, you know? And I wasn't aware that the actor is literally the last person to see the script. This was like, here, have your script recorded. And, so, and they were throwing curveballs at me all the time. And, and that was true because I was such a huge fan of the Joker and I knew him front to back. But then to go into the script uh, for season one, especially um, trying to come up with my own version of this character, but not having really a grasp of what Telltale actually wanted for the character. And I think as the series progressed, they they started to get to grips with that. But but really every episode was written before it was going to come out. It was like, here's the script for uh, episode one, you know, of season two. And then they would change it. And then there would be, I would come back, uh, um, you know, a couple of weeks later and the scene would be totally different. Um, and that was interesting, but, but it was difficult because you would form an idea of the character of where you think he's going, but then they would, they would again flip it because John Doe in season one was a, a more menacing, manipulative kind of guy. Uh, and then he became a real lovable puppy in the season two. And, and then they were playing with him becoming more evil much earlier but then that, but they scrapped that. They 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 ended up going with the more uh, sympathetic character, which was really interesting. But yeah, it was just you know learning as you go. <laughs> I mean, I remember in, in in the episode two of season two in the bar scene, instead of Bruce defending John, John was going to attack Willie, and he carved his his name into his forehead with a penknife or something at the bar, and we recorded all that, but but it didn't make it in the final game because. Test audiences didn't like that. They liked uh, the build up, you know. And you were able to betray John in episode three instead of Catwoman. You could put John in the freezer, you know, and and stuff like stuff like that. Uh, which which, you know, the, the diverging branches, you know, um, and things like that. But it was really just a question on their minds. I think of how do we play the Joker differently. And I was I was along for. It. I, I really enjoyed it. All the different things, and it really was just a choose your own adventure. So I think. I had a grasp of what they wanted, and then if they would throw different scenarios at me, I could sort of adapt. What did you do to make Catwoman purr? How can I get that with Harley? How can I make her see me? You just need to be genuine. You're special, John. She just needs to see that. So, be myself. I hear that a lot, but... How can I be myself if I don't really know who that is yet? How did you know who you are, Bruce? To be honest, I, I don't. No one does. People lie to themselves about their true nature. Uh, maybe I'm lying to myself. That would explain something I've noticed recently. I can feel someone. A few layers deep, pacing like an animal in a cage, just looking for something to start it. That all marked a moment of genuine disbelief for me. This turmoil of commitment to what his heart desires was tearing him apart. And at the center of all of it was us. We are responsible for what he becomes. The character relationships and interactions are where this game shines brightest. Everything about them is an amazing love letter to the source material. John's descent into insanity and anarchy as the villain, or even as a failing vigilante, just mirrors his actual comic counterpart we all know and love. John Doe is now truly iconic for being a complete subversion of everyone's expectations, and his story is now a hallmark of Joker stories. Also, I really, really appreciated the, the Enemy Within trophy in LEGO DC Supervillains when he took a photo with Batman as Joker. It's such a nice, cute little detail that pays homage to the series, and it's these little details like this that really show how much of an impact this story has had on Batman media. Something that I really feel needs the attention is the soundtrack, more specifically John's theme. 
It's this really disturbingly creepy and unsettling tune of just a few piano keys. To paraphrase a YouTube comment I saw about it, it's a reflection of John's schizophrenia. Everything is offbeat. The piano notes stumble into one another almost clumsily, yet the high pitch maintains its sharp and hard-edged nature. It's just so creepy and it automatically takes me to this scary, cold, lonely place where an unknown threat lurks. It's terrifying and honestly contributes to Anthony's unsettling performance. It's as though John is being slowly twisted until an inevitable snap. Whenever it plays, I'm reminded that John isn't necessarily our friend. He's a dangerous patient from a psychiatric hospital. And that is terrifying. It sends a cold shiver down my spine, and that's exactly the feeling that I'd want to get from this character. At first, it was just trying not to do an impression. <laughs> so it was like, you know, I was trying to avoid that, that, uh, that, that um, temptation. And then as it went on, I really got to grips with the John Doe character to the point that I forgot that I was sort of playing the Joker. The way he was written was very easy to empathize with, so it wasn't a huge leap for me to draw on my own emotions and stuff like that. If, if I had to play a guy who was awkward and nervous and stuff, it's not that hard, you know? Um, and, and, and that sort of fish out of water feeling. And that, that was sort of my approach, was just trying to pay homage, fancy word, uh, while still doing something original uh, with, with it that, that would fit in this universe. I wouldn't just be a rehash of uh, someone else's performance. I wanted to submit something that was more um, original, like my own sort of interpretation of the character. Um, and yeah, that, that was the, the, the tricky thing was just not doing the impression because, you know, they, they I found out later they really didn't want a Hamill or, um, or a Ledger or, or a Nicholson. Um, they wanted something that was different. Uh, and and um, so that was that was really a challenge. And, and so I, I had to sort of incorporate my own history of the character, like what I knew of him and how he was uh, conventionally portrayed. Um, but then trying to flip it on its head and do something different. Uh, but, you know, my own fanboyism came out and uh, I, did, I did use elements of the actors that inspired me throughout the performance just to sort of give some sort of thing of like, okay, this is how he's familiar to people, but still be different. It sounds cheesy, but I just, I felt a connection to him. Like I did really like him a lot. Huge Joker fan, but I, I really liked John Doe. Like I enjoyed playing John Doe more. Probably the only problem I have with this character is that in episode 3 of season 2, your objective is to get access to Harley's laptop, and you can do this one of two ways. Get Catwoman to steal it, or get John to steal it. Both Catwoman and John are compelled to retrieve it for you for their own reasons, however in both of my playthroughs I never felt the need to get John to grab the laptop. Catwoman always pulled through, and to me it just seems like the more obvious and quote unquote canonical route. That being said, if you do get John to give you the laptop, you're treated to a neat little scene of Batman teaching John how to throw a batarang. So that's a sweet little moment of bonding. On the Catwoman route, you're treated to some great development between Batman and Catwoman's will-they-won't-they they relationship. So both routes are equally viable, however I feel like the game somewhat railroads or encourages the player to side with Catwoman, and in fact, Batman relying on John to steal the laptop as well just seemed counterproductive and kind of redundant, because Catwoman was already going to get it for you. Now this isn't necessarily a bad thing, just a momentary instance where I felt like there was a correct path to take, as opposed to the rest of the game really allowing you to side with whoever without there being any factors to dissuade or encourage the player to work through a specific path. Telltale makes it their business to always present a benefit and a risk for taking a side, so you're never really swayed either Either way, it's down to whichever you personally think will be the best outcome for your playthrough. It's down to what you want to prioritise, not what the game thinks you should prioritise. For instance, the climax between Penguin and Two-Face in Season 1. If you go after Dent, your gadgets are compromised because of Penguin at Wayne Tower, and consequently there are lives you cannot save. However, if you go after Penguin, Dent burns Wayne Manor and executes innocent people. So there's not really a better option or a worse option, it's entirely down to the player's actions, and you don't feel pressured or encouraged to pick either side. Now that specifically is a huge selling point for Season 2, because the main pull for the season was the fact that you could forge John into an ally or an enemy. Both the vigilante ending and the villain ending have their own interesting elements. 
One might be more privy to see the villain ending so they can see this man become the insane clown prince of crime they all know. Or they might want to see him become this failed hero out of intrigue and so that they can see the fundamental difference between Batman and the Joker. I know you used me. I, I know. I should hate you for that. <laughs> but I, I don't. Because... A good time with you, Bruce. Did did you ever did you ever think of me as your friend? Like a, a true friend? So, someone you actually c care about? Of course. Of course you were my friend. <laughs> you are one messed up guy. <laughs> the the vigilante Joker version is just such a unique take on the character of Joker that it's really hard to not do that. Plus, I feel like most of the people playing the game, you become so attached to John and you want so badly to stop him from becoming the Joker that you wind up doing the vigilante route most of the time. There's so much good stuff in the villain route that I feel bad that, you know, saying necessarily that vigilante Joker is the way to go. It's just so well written. Both are well written. As far as like an intended way to play, I think, no, I think if you want to get what you want out of this character, you can play it however you like, um, which is what makes it interesting. That's the debate, isn't it, about the, about the endings, if they're that different. But I think in, in, in this particular story, I think the endings are vastly different. And depending on how you how you treat this guy, um, you can get vastly different outcomes. And that, that I think is, is liberating for a player. And I think that's, that's what makes it fun to play. So yeah, I think, uh, play it how you like. The villain route is really well written and I like it a lot. I, I like a lot of the stuff Harley has to do in that one too. You know, it's a tough call, but um, the other thing I really like is that they, I mean, and again, this is the hallmark of Telltale Games. There's a lot of really hard decisions to make. I really liked it. I thought, um, ironically, I'm a, a massive Joker fan, but I love John Doe. Um, I think the first four episodes of season two are, are my favorites. Yeah, he was such a sympathetic character, and he was a really interesting and engaging character. Uh, I think that's why he resonated with people, and that was something that I really liked. And then the idea of him becoming a vigilante, I don't think had really been done before. There's a few, there was a few comics in the 60s where uh, Joker mimicked Batman, like he had his own utility belt and stuff, and I think they played that up in the episode. Um, but, but that sort of genuine earnestness to be a good guy I don't think had been done before. Seeing this this guy that's typically portrayed as a monster um, was was really uh, compelling. Uh, but yeah, I would say for me, like the vigilante option would be uh, my preferred route, um, just because uh, it, it's more in keeping with the sort of John Doe theme. Uh, and just that, that this is really like, for me, it's like an Elseworlds story where everything is different. Bruce Wayne's parents are mobsters, and you know Vicky Vale is a, is a super villain. So it was it makes sense that the Joker would be a good guy. I do appreciate how he couldn't abide by Batman's rules and saw it as an antiquated sense of morality, but he was essentially Red Hood. Like Red Hood, he resorted to killing, and although he had the same intentions as Batman, he had a deadlier, more permanent method. I feel like that kind of undermined the fearful impact Batman had developed over the criminals all throughout Season 1. However, seeing his descent into insanity and into the Joker we all know was pretty damn cool. It's interesting to consider the Joker as a failed hero turned villain, someone who wanted to play by the rules but fundamentally didn't agree with them. But for all its efforts, for me at least, it just felt flat, forced and rushed and it felt like a discount Red Hood story. Him becoming a vigilante really came out of almost nowhere. He had really no reason to want to inspire good on the forefront of vigilantism like Batman, and if the game had set up anything well up until that point, it was that he would make an amazing villain. Because he was deep in the stew with the pact, and while we could see Bruce's conflicting motives when he had to do crime to not blow his cover, John had no such conflict. 
In fact, he enjoyed it. At no point did he see Bane brutally tear someone apart and feel bad. Even while he was a vigilante, his whole thing was that he was just itching to use the criminal methods he was familiar with and believed was correct. His impressionability may have tempted him to want to be good like his idol, Batman, but the scales are unbalanced. He has so much riding on him turning bad, and he justifiably has actual, reasonable, empathetic motives to fall into crazed villainy that it really just felt flat, although unique and interesting, underdeveloped. Because we'd seen it all before, but done a hundred times better with Red Hood. And I desperately want to praise the game for taking such a gamble with this option, to take John in this direction. But I gotta be critical, and from a purely subjective standpoint, it just didn't agree with me. At least him becoming a villain made sense. He was caught between love and loyalty, and it made him show his true colours while exposing the true manipulative nature of the only person he really connected with, Bruce. And to have Bruce deceiving him as Batman just contributed to this. So when he feels alone and he finally believes that everything Bruce had done wasn't for genuine concern, but just to make him buy into this elaborate lie for his own ends, his love for Harley is all he has. Thus, his madness consumes him. Harley falls in love with him and he becomes the Joker. And it's just a lot more meaningful this way because it makes sense. And it just goes to show that sometimes the most obvious route is the most reasonable route. It's an overused trope because it works, and Telltale had already laid the groundwork to still make it a brand new experience. After everything Telltale had planted since season 1, this was the ultimate payoff that mattered, and it was the only one that really left me with a sense of satisfaction. Bruce had failed John. He had turned him into a monster, and the man pacing just a few layers deep had finally come to surface. This, in my opinion, was the true route to go with. He's much more captivating as a ruthless, hatred-ridden villain with a grudge against Bruce, teaming up with Harley who, at this point, would also have a grudge against Bruce. The stakes are higher, it feels more personal, and it makes sense. When you're playing a vigilante route, you want him to be a hero, but because you're always expecting and anticipating him becoming a villain, it kind of misses the whole point of it. But in the villain route, you're actively contributing to an engaging next chapter of the story, because John's arc has essentially been completed. The villain route gave some finality to John's arc, and spent the rest of its time showcasing how his new identity has shaped him into a formidable villain. Whereas the vigilante route feels almost like a 180 of everything he had been building up to until that point, in an effort to prolong his character development and result in the exact same payoff. As a villain, you see him have this hatred for Bruce, attack his building, betray his friends, and force you into a sick game. We see the Joker and Harley Quinn dynamic, and it perfectly pays homage to their Bonnie and Clyde relationship. I wonder if in future seasons they had planned to bring in that element of abuse, and it would be interesting to see that it come from Harley instead of Joker. And by the looks of it, I would think it will. If he remained a vigilante through and through, perhaps it would have been more rewarding? Perhaps he would take on the mantle of a Robin-like figure in later seasons? I don't know, I'm not even sure if that would be a good route to take considering Tiffany is already filling that role. But perhaps there could be some internal conflict between them competing for Bruce's approval. These are just ideas, but I'm not sure I like the vigilante ending. However, on the other side of the coin, Villain Joker is far more satisfying. You see that he's conflicted between this obsession and hatred he has for Bruce, and it tears him apart and it channels this new layer of insanity through him. You can't read him like you used to. He's unpredictable, and the only thing stopping him from killing you is the fact that he wants to continually torture you. I like how Joker doesn't actually want to destroy Gotham like Harley. He just doesn't care for that anarchy. In fact, he willingly betrays her. His goals are far more trivial because he instead wants to destroy you, and it makes for completely personal stakes and makes him a formidable threat. The last scene between them was monumental, and it made me tear up. It not only gave us that rivalry between the two that we're all so familiar with, but it gave new depth to it, and it made me honestly feel terrible for my actions. It made me desperately wish that I had never met him because we had cursed him to this maddening existence and turned him into a monster. And to top it all off, the Joker actually made Bruce break his one rule. Holy shit. As a vigilante, you confront Joker as Batman. As a villain, you confront Joker as Bruce. 
In the end, Joker faces off with whoever had the most influence on him and whoever he feels most betrayed by. As Bruce in the villain ending, it's far more personal. The music that plays when you assess your choices at the end of each episode plays in the final confrontation between Bruce and villain Joker. It's the culmination of all of your choices, the evil, monstrous fallout of your actions. It audibly makes you aware and feel guilty. Now that was definitely the most controversial part of my video. I want to say that this is simply my own opinion, and I'm not saying that to shield myself from criticism, but instead to tell you that you're more than welcome to disagree with me and think I'm full of crap. I know that there's people who adore the vigilante route, and I'm jealous. I wish I could too. And I think because of this incredible personal attachment I now have with the series, I'm more likely to highlight the things that really get under my skin. And that is a remarkable thing within itself, because that is one of the very few legitimate honest criticisms that I have with this game, and I wouldn't dedicate so much time to it if I didn't care about the story, but I do. So in comparison to the whole rest of Season 1 and Season 2, that is the only real problem I have with the game at all. Because to me, it's damn near perfect. Remember that night? Drinking frappes under the stars. You dishing out advice about the ladies. Me finding out you were the bat. It was perfect. <sighs> You know, some part of me always knew. Someone like you? You'd never really be friends with someone like me. But I wanted to believe it so badly. <laughs> we had some good times. Didn't we, Bruce? It wasn't all bad. Yeah, sure. Some of it was fun. I, I hope you'll look at that scar and remember those good times. <laughs> The Joker that Telltale has created is phenomenal. The whole dynamic between Batman and the Joker is their codependence. One cannot exist without the other. That's their twisted, cyclical nature of violence and trauma. The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Returns portrays this really well. They are destined to fight forever through every iteration of Batman. It's compelling and it's interesting, but at the end of the day, they're just words on a page in a comic, or lines and themes that drive a great film. What we've always missed but never quite knew we needed in order to truly understand and appreciate their relationship was to physically feel it, was to breathe it in, influence it, live through it, actively be responsible for it, have physical agency in their actions and to forge this uniquely authentic sense of empathy so that when this shit hits the fan and everything crumbles beneath the character's feet, you are there with them in the moment. This is one of the few times that I've ever felt sorry for the Joker, and him being that destructive consequence to all your actions, all your betrayals, all of your lies and all of your relationships really cement him as the perfect villain in this story. So when he says that he is the perfect villain, I believe him, because he's a villain to Bruce and by extension us, not necessarily Batman. He knows how to really hurt Bruce and again, now us. And that is something that will forever haunt our protagonist. He's going to be around forever. Again, it's it's a character that's open to so many different reinventions, and you know that's what makes it interesting. It's not because it doesn't feel like a remake again. It's like a reimagination. There's plenty of you know different um, interpretations that that this character can go through, and I don't think that we've seen the last of him for a long time, uh, which is uh, yeah, that's pretty interesting. 
Now, very quickly, I'm going to discuss the post credit scene of Season 2, Episode 5. As a recap, both endings see the Joker in jail, however, in the Vigilante ending, he's visited by Bruce. I believe this post credit scene actually takes place sometime in the next season. I have a theory for this. Although it may be Bruce visiting him out of necessity for something in the next season, it could even be him paying a visit to try and reconnect with him and remind John that he's a good person. But my theory is that isn't actually Bruce at all. My theory is that the man we saw visit John was actually Hush. If you know anything about Hush, it's essentially that he surgically remakes his face to look like Bruce Wayne's. He's a friend turned mortal enemy of Bruce. I think he would pose as Bruce and get John out and work together somehow. The biggest reason why I think it's Hush is due to the nature of Telltale. All throughout this video I've said a staple of the story is deception and lies. What's more deceiving than posing as someone to ruin their public image and relationships, which are huge stakes to consider across the seasons? Hush has a personal tie to Bruce, so him doing this isn't out of the question. However, Hush hasn't been so much as mentioned thus far, so it's a weak theory, but rather something really cool to consider. If you've been tracking alongside the Telltale games for a while, you'll know that recently they went under and shut down. However, all hope isn't yet lost, as from what I know, and please don't quote me as a reliable source, several studios bought the assets and properties from Telltale to continue the games. Among these are, and I'm going to butcher this name so I apologise, Ad Hoc Studio, made up of former Telltale Games employees to continue the legacy of their stories. They are currently producing another season for another Telltale property called The Wolf Among Us. Personally, I haven't yet played this, but I've heard nothing but good things from it. And while this is happening, another company called Skybound is carrying The Walking Dead, the final season, to its conclusion. However, what happens beyond that remains to be seen. A little shred of hope that may or may not exist for Telltale Batman actually comes directly from the Telltale Twitter account, who at the start of the year changed their profile pic and header to the Enemy Within promotional material. Maybe I'm looking into it a little far, but it never hurts to be hopeful that something is happening with Batman. And if nothing happens for the next few years, what's stopping a group of creators coming together to continue the story in some form of webcomic? Certainly something to keep in mind. So after everything I've said, it's quite clear that I have nothing but pure love for this game. This was a love letter as much as it was a critique and I wouldn't change that for a second. It's unique. It's different. You know that. I know that. I think it's what makes it different that makes it so special. In a time where we are being oversaturated now more than ever with superhero material, specifically Batman, it's refreshing to see it done this way. And don't get me wrong, I have no issue with the oversaturation. If you know me or have seen my other videos, then you'll know that I appreciate it and I'll probably never stop loving it. Without all of the other stories we know and have come to accept as the gold standard for what Batman is, with its distinct characters and stories, this one simply wouldn't stand out. Because we've gotten so used to all of those, this version stands out for being so unlike any of them. The Telltale Batman experience is like none other. I am so, so happy that I played these games and met these characters because they've had a real profound impact on me. These people don't feel like actors at all. They feel entirely like people. Believable, three-dimensional characters with immense depth. These games taught me quite a lot about creative writing in ways that no amount of screenwriting courses could ever do. In fact, I finished this game and went on to write a feature-length Batman-inspired screenplay adapted from Paul Dini and Bruce Timm's Mad Love comic story. I honestly think I had more fun playing Telltale's Batman for the first time than I did playing any of the Arkham games. You may have noticed throughout this review how often I've compared Bruce's actions to your own. I've made it clear that the game positions you to create this really intimate bond with the player and the character. We feel his discomfort, his happiness, his pity, his guilt. When playing the game, the thought never crossed my mind that I was playing a game, rather living an actual Batman simulated experience that felt so, so real. It felt like the perfect comic come to life and dictated by your actions like a Goosebumps novel. It's just so saddening to see how far this game flies under people's radars. In fact, there's that new animated movie, The Death of the Family, which plays, to a lesser extent, like a telltale game. 
Recently, Robert Pattinson's Batman got a teaser trailer, and I am so pumped for it. It's directly up my alley, and if you want, you can chat to me about it on Twitter. Link in the description. But the thing that really stood out to me was how similar it is to the Telltale Batman games, right down from the mystery to the tone to the duality of Bruce Wayne in it, and not to mention just how similar Pattinson's Batman is to the Batsuit from The Enemy Within. So I'm really looking forward to it and just how it may or may not draw from what we love in the Telltale series. So to bring this video to a sense of full rounded closure, I'll draw upon the point I raised at the very start of this review. It's a perfect Batman story. Now look, it is entirely subjective, but I'd be kidding myself if I said I didn't wholeheartedly believe in this claim. These are my honest thoughts and feelings, and you have every reason to agree or disagree. That is for you to decide. That sense of subjectivity is exactly why I said it's the perfect Batman story, because that sense of perfection in and of itself is subjective, and I think this game has something different to offer everyone. Due to its interactive and malleable nature, the player can really shape their own experience, and so I think that no matter how you play it, you're always going to forge your own sense of that perfect story, and you're always going to shape the story into something that appeals to you. Yes, you. Not us. You. This is your experience. Placing the control over every aspect of a character we love so much gives us that opportunity to make something that we love. So the perfect Batman story that exists within this game for me might not be the same perfect Batman story that exists within this game for you. And that's for you to find for yourself. Bruce will forever be burdened and haunted by his life as Batman. One way or another, he will always be in danger because of the life he chose. No amount of your choices will ever change that. Telltale gives the player a sense of agency over their choices. The overarching story itself will inevitably start and end in fixed places, however the interactions and character relationships in between are constantly evolving as per the player's actions. What this proves more than anything else is that the events of a story may connect the dots and act as a framework, but the characters and their conflicts and complications will always provide the true sustenance of a story. The true choice that Telltale gives us is one of subjectivity. The paths may diverge, but they will inevitably end in the same place, and it is your decision where you take that story and how you mould its characters. Because we don't care that the Joker and Harley Quinn plan to release the virus across the city. That is Batman's objective to stop. What we care about as the player are the characters themselves. We care to see them and interact with them far more than we care to stop their evil plan. And this is something Telltale really understands. Even though you won, you still feel like you lost. The characters are the absolute essential part of any story, and when you have characters as meaningful and compelling as the ones from the Telltale series, then your story will be one to remember. I will never forget the hopeful tragedy of Harvey Dent, and I will never forget the lovable compassion of John Doe. Those two characters are my favourite across the two seasons, because they had an amazing emotional impact, and consequently they mean something to me. Telltale took the choices that damn Bruce Wayne to a life of misery and constructed an amazing story around it. Telltale managed to take the marginally more boring side of Batman and make him phenomenal. Telltale did something really, really special for Batman. And I will never forget that. Thanks for watching! Please consider hitting that old subscribe button or I'll get our old pal John to pay you a little visit.
consider this a threat. You want a nice little drinking game to put you in the emergency room and get your stomach pumped for the evening? Take a shot every time I say the words Batman, really, Bruce-like game, telltale and story. (laughs) There's a good 465 shots between those seven words alone. You will die. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to both Anthony and Laura for appearing in this video for an interview. Honestly, thank you so much. I appreciate it and I'm honoured by you taking the time to talk with me and it was incredibly interesting to hear your own insights and experiences with your characters and this game. And it's forever going to be something that I can cherish to say that I have personally spoken with the voice actors of two of my favourite characters of all time in one of my favourite video games. And to everyone else, stay safe and supported out there. Until next time.